Our second lab is the chemistry and cytology lab. Unfortunately, the only chemistry part in this lab is an, is an experiment, and so we're not going to be able to do that online. And so we're going to focus on the cytology. Cytology is the study of cells. And so this is going to be a, a lab on cell structure. And you'll see at the beginning, we'll learn about parts of a microscope because when you look at cells, they're so small, we have to use a microscope. So we scroll down to the first page. We have a diagram of a microscope and some terms that we can use to fill these in. So up here, we have what is called the ocular lens. And on this microscope, there are two of them. And so you look in with both eyes. You've certainly seen pictures of microscopes where there is only one of these ocular lenses. Where this is the ocular lens, this is called the objective lens, or just the objective. And so on this microscope, there are three of them. And each one has a different magnification power. And so this whole thing is able to turn. You just grab it and turn it. And so you can change the magnification that you're looking at your slide with. We'll see on the next page that the ocular lens also has magnification. And so the total magnification that you see is the magnification from the objective lens times multiplied by the magnification of the ocular lens. This main support piece here is the arm. If you're going to pick a microscope up, you would put one hand and hold on the arm and put the other hand under the bottom. This here is the stage. The microscope slide would go on this stage. Underneath the stage is the iris diaphragm. Just like the iris in your eye controls how much light gets into your eye, the iris diaphragm is going to determine how much light gets from the lamp down here, up through your slide, into the objective lens, and then into your eye. This here is the stage adjustment knob, which will allow you to fine-tune the stage location. This large knob over here is actually two knobs. So there's a large knob on the outside, and then a smaller knob on the inside. The large knob is the coarse focus knob. The smaller one in the middle is the fine focus knob. And so if you put a, a microscope slide on the stage, you would use the coarse focus knob to get it pretty close to in focus, and then you would use the fine focus knob in order to get it perfect for you. We all have different eyesight, and so what's in focus for me is probably not going to be in focus for you. And so in that case, you would have to adjust the fine focus knob. It's very unlikely our eyes are so different that you would have to adjust the coarse focus knob. So this is what I was talking about with the magnification. And so if we take the objective lens here and then multiply it by the ocular lens magnification here, we get the total magnification. So you don't have a microscope to take these off of. And so what I'm going to tell you is that the, in, on most microscopes, the ocular lens is a 10 X magnification. It multiplies the magnification by 10. The objective lens normally goes 4, 20, and 100. And so we're going to go with those powers and you can calculate the total magnification over here. Part D here requires you to look at some slides and so this isn't the most important part of, of the lab, and so we're actually going to skip part D here. You don't have to look at this slide or answer these questions that go with these slides. 
Next, we have to look at cell structure. Hopefully, you've gone through the cell lecture before you do this. If you do, it's going to make a lot more sense because we're going to name a whole bunch of structures on this cell. And if you haven't gone through the lecture, it's not going to make the most sense to you. So up here, well, first of all, what we're looking at here is a single cell. We'll say this is a human cell. And then on the outside is the plasma membrane. That's going to essentially define the boundaries of the cell. We have a large nucleus in the middle here and then a bunch of other organelles out here in the cytoplasm. So we're going to just kind of start at the top and work our way down. We said this was the nucleus, this large spherical shaped thing. And so that is this line here. The outside of the nucleus is the nuclear membrane. That's what separates the nucleus from everything around it, the nuclear membrane. And then in the very, very center of this is the nucleolus or nucleolus. Over here is the smooth ER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This is the rough ER or rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so you can see that the rough has these dots on it. The dots are ribosomes. So the rough ER has ribosomes, whereas the smooth ER does not. The rough ER is next to the nucleus, where the smooth ER is further away from the nucleus. This line here is pointing to what seems like empty space between the organelles. There is no empty space. Everything is filled. This is basically water, and so this is the cytosol. This orb here is a lysosome. This line is pointing to these structural filaments here. This is a microfilament. This line is pointing to these little appendages down here. These are the microvilli. This line is pointing to this structure. This is a centrosome, which is made up of two centrioles. <coughs> this large structure here, with the folds in it, is a mitochondria. So the singular term is mitochondrion, and plural is mitochondria. This sphere here, that we can see is dumping material outside of the cell, is a vesicle. This green folding area here is the Golgi. Uh, what else? We have this was the plasma membrane that we talked about initially. So I believe that we have gone through and named each of these. Make sure you go through the lecture and know the function of these. The lab exam will include not, ju not just the name, but the function of all of the things on this diagram. Next are cells from microscope slides. Obviously, unless you go into open lab, you won't be able to see these slides. And so we're going to go based off solely the pictures that are included in this lab manual. So the lab exam could be this exact picture, or I could find another picture that is of the same thing. You need to be familiar enough with these that if you see a similar picture, you know what you're looking at. For each of them, you need to know four things. You need to know what they are. So for example, red blood cells or sperm cell. You need to know the function of each. You need to know where they are located and what special features there are for each one. What makes them unique from each other. 
So first are the red blood cells. The red blood cells are these pinkish ones where there's a whole lot of them. These bluish colored ones are white blood cells. So we're not looking at those on this particular slide. We're looking at the red blood cells. So obviously these are located in our bloodstream and their main function is to carry oxygen. The special feature for the red blood cells is that they are a flat shape almost like a donut where the hole didn't go all the way through. And so it's a, a flat shape with dimples in the middle on each side but they don't actually make a hole going all the way through. If you go online you can find a nice picture of it. Also red blood cells don't have a nucleus. There are only a few types of cells in your body that don't have a nucleus. Red blood cells are one of them. Next are sperm cells. And so what you're looking at here is the purple dots are the main body of a cell and then you see a long flagella coming off. So the function of the sperm cell is to fertilize an egg in for the of the reproductive system. And the special features are the flagella. These are the only cells in a human that are able to swim. Next are two types of muscle cells. We have smooth muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells. Eventually we'll learn that there is a third type of muscle cell, the cardiac muscle, but at this point we're just dealing with the first two. The first is smooth muscle. What I want you to notice on this one, compared to this one, is that each cell is much smaller. Smooth muscle cells are smaller than the skeletal muscle cells. When you look at the skeletal muscle cells, this is an entire cell, believe it or not, that extends off the left and right side of the slide. The smooth muscle cells are small. There's one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. So smooth muscle cells are small. Skeletal muscle cells are very large. Also, Smooth muscle cells have one nucleus per cell. Skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei per cell. The nuclei are these purple dots. When you look at slides, look for the darker purple dots. That's staining DNA, and DNA is located in the nucleus. And so if you look, you can see there's one nucleus per cell here. Down here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, whole bunch of nuclei in one cell. Smooth muscle is involuntary, meaning we can't decide when it contracts, when it moves, when it does what it does. Skeletal muscle is voluntary. We can control when we move our skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscle is also striated. It's kind of difficult to see in this particular picture, but there are alternating dark and light pink bands in skeletal muscle. We call those striations. When we cover muscle more in depth, we'll learn why those striations exist. The smooth muscle does not. So if you see muscle and it is not striated, it's going to be smooth muscle, because cardiac muscle, we'll learn, is striated also. The final slide down here is a motor neuron. A neuron is a nerve cell. So the neuron here is the very large cell. It look, kind of looks like a squid or an octopus. The smaller dots around it are called neuroglia. There are other cells that they're not part of this particular lab. We'll cover those later on. A neuron is part of the nervous system and it's going to conduct electricity. It's going to move information through our body in the form of electricity. It's located in our nervous system and it has three main parts. There's the cell body, which is the main part here. 
There are dendrites, which receive information, and axons that send information. For the most part, dendrites are smaller than axons. So when I look at this particular picture, I would say that this, 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 and this are dendrites, and this one large projection is an axon. Next, there are some questions for you to fill out. And then there are phases of the cell cycle. So we talk about the cell cycle in our lecture. And so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly again. These stages of the cell cycle of mitosis are not in order. It says they are not in the correct order. So what you need to do is you need to go through and based on what's in each picture, figure out what's going on, and then based on what's going on, determine which phase of mitosis you are going through. And so remember, there are four phases of mitosis. There's PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. There are five pictures here. One of them is interphase. So one of them is when the cell is not dividing. The other four is when the cell is going through mitosis or dividing. So put what phase is going on. Tell what events are happening during that phase here. And then we need to fill in these labels over here. This is pointing at these. These are chromatids. So this is the DNA being divided between two cells. This is pointing at where these cells are starting to separate here. This is called a cleavage furrow. This is pointing at this imaginary line going through the center of this one cell. So this is where these chromosomes are going to line up and when they line up, they're going to get split into two new cells. This is called the metaphase plate. So that hopefully tells you which phase of mitosis we're going through here. This is a centrosome. So this is where this mitotic spindle forms. We saw the centrosome in our cell diagram at the beginning. And then this down here is called chromatin. This is DNA that is not condensed into visible chromosomes. So if you look at this under the microscope, all you see is a blue blur. In mitosis, you see individual chromosomes, whereas down here, you don't. There's some questions that go along with that. And then the last thing here is the chemistry experiment that we're not going to be able to do. What this want was going to show you is in we have dialysis tubing. So dialysis tubing allows water to pass across it, but other things like salt and sugar are not able to. And so what we were going to do is in, di in the dialysis tubing, we have starch and glucose dissolved in water. Outside of the dialysis membrane, we have water with iodine in it. Iodine will stain starch. Iodine, when it comes in contact with starch, will make it dark purple. And so, what we would see is that the iodine would go across the dialysis tubing to the inside, and it would stain the starch purple. Iodine is small, and so it can cross the membrane. Starch is large. Starch and glucose are large molecules, and so they can't get out. The iodine can go in, starch and glucose cannot. So that's the end of this lab. You don't have to fill, answer these questions. You're not responsible for this. This exercise 5 will not be on the lab exam. Let me know if you have, have any questions. When you're ready, you can move on to the next lab.